All right. Great. So, so actually, I just wanted to give a very sort of brief overview of what I'm sure that my other colleagues, um, including Suzette and Henry and Vera, will be talking about a lot more further in depth in, in the same session. So it's just, this is generally a very, very basic overview of, of, of really how I think Eric has at least impacted specifically my career, but also not only throughout my career, but also just overall the careers of my Latin American colleagues as well, especially in South America. So um, this is a, basically, I'll, I'll just start this entire um, talk with just basically a story. And the story that I'd like to show you is this basically. So this is of course uh, a Tilly diagram, which I'm probably all of you are very familiar with. And this is ba what you're seeing here is actually sort of kind of historical now. And this is a diagram that was almost published 20 years ago. It's part of a paper that was part of my PhD thesis back then. And at that time, I was working in the Atacama Desert, especially specifically in areas like that, like the, the, the area that you see in the photograph there. And we were collecting, you know, rhodomininins that were, which is were studies that were pioneered in the southwestern U.S. to, to look at paleoecological change in arid lands and arid landscapes. And of course, Julio Betancourt is one of the main uh, major uh, proponents of this sort of this sort of field line of research. And of course, he was on my advising committee. And so Julio and I started to, to work on a mineral record from the Atacama Desert, you know, way back in the, in the late 90s. And as part of that research, I was visiting Julio often in his lab when he was still at Tuma Mock Hill in the, in the desert lab there in Tucson, Arizona. And one of the things that, that I brought um, up to the lab is, is, is Tilia. So interestingly enough, um, none of the paleocologists that were working, at least in the, in the mining crowd, were using Tilia to plot up their information because really they hadn't, it, Tilia was never designed to look, you know, look at rodents, for example, or how to apply that that kind of you know that kind of record to uh, to, uh, to 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 a stratigraphic so to a software that's basically designed to plot out a stratigraphy, and so in, we basically you know substituted time for for the for the for the depth in the in the in the diagram, and then we could just easily plot in you know the microfossil abundances that you can see in rodents. So that's really how and the diagram you're seeing here is one of the very first diagrams that was published in both the Americas of a rodent record. So it, it it really is sort of sort of this. You can see right away that this is how you know Eric immediately, even though this was even before I even I even met Eric, and I was actually using Tilia, and I bought you know the program with me to on one of my many visits to Julio's lab, in 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 the late '90s and early 2000s. So the reason why I start this story is that it you know doesn't doesn't it pique your curiosity to find out why the hell a Chileno was using Tilia in the late '90s and the reason for that is actually is actually goes even further back in time, and it actually goes back to something that was called PEP one. So I'm I'm pretty sure a lot of you older folks that are in the audience today are probably know what PEP one is and probably remember that. And PEP was this polar equator pole transect that was spearheaded in part by Vera Markgraf, and of course Avera formed a very important part of that because he was providing the software that was being used in, in order to contabulate and tabulate all the pollen data. From the different records that you can see here on the figure. And Vera, of course, being Pylon also she is, and of course she'll be giving the next talk, so I won't go from much further into detail on that. But it, it actually was very important because Vera was very much in touch with what my, 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 my PhD supervisor was Carolina Villagran. And Carolina, of course, was a, was a very well-known Chilean palynologist, um, pretty much started using Tilia right away as, you know, as, as it was provided by Eric through Vera. And then, of course, another colleague of mine was was just fresh out of his PhD, uh, hired by the University of Chile um, in the very late '90s, Patricio Moreno. And Patricio, well, coming from from you know George Jacobson School of Palynology, was very very much well trained in the use of Tiliograph and Tilia. So between Patricio, Carolina, and Vera, you know, I can see that that's basically the reason why a Chileno would bring Tilia back, you know, sort of reimport it as sort of the Great American Biotic Interchange back into the U.S. with them. To work in a mineral lab, and that's the reason why we started using Tilia and to plot up mineral data. And so, and that of course didn't stop there. So there's now in Neotoma a uh, formal mineral group that's actually figuring that used that worked directly with Eric to figure out even better ways that we can incorporate mineral data into the Neotoma database, the ecological database. So that's sort of the the the, the first half of the story, right? And then. 
Of course, you know, Vera and Eric were the fundamental in the creation of the Latin American pollen data, which is one of the products that stemmed off from basically from PEP1. So PEP1 is actually was very key in actually in, in just generating all the science that was needed in order to gain all this data to be publicly available. And of course, that was the seed for the, for the Latin American pollen database. And that's basically what you can see on the map on the left is the number of sites in South America that are currently in the pollen database. And I think those actually include several million sites as well now. So um, of course, I won't go into further detail on this because of course, the will be talking, I think, about, about this in much more length than I will. And she was actually the key actor in that in that story. So it's not very much, you know, what uh, it, it's not necessarily something I need to talk about more in depth. But one of the things I really want to talk about in depth is the fact that um, now moving her a little bit further in time, uh, I really, really wanted to talk to Eric because of the fact that you know Eric and I already discussed about and we discussed in Inqua in Bern back in 2010 the possibility of of Eric coming down to Chile and teaching. Um, directly sort of involving people in the use of the new, of, of not only new, the Neotoma platform, but also the new versions of Tilly that were coming out, which were interfacing with that platform. And, and for me, it's always been key to have a, a very, very, you know, a large repository of ecological data for South America. And as, and as Vera will probably testify, it, it's not easy to get South American paleontologists, you know, to write in to contribute their data to, to open databases like that, because, you know, there's, there's so much time and effort as we all know that goes into dating these records and the effort, you know, I, I, of course, counting the pollen is the same for everyone, but sometimes getting the funding, getting enough money to actually go in the field is a, it can actually be a huge challenge for South American scientists. So, you know, there, there's, there's so much effort involved sometimes in generating this data that it's not easily to convince them to share the data after it's been published. And, I, and, and if in the end, but I was always convinced that for, for any, scientific endeavor to be successful over time, the, the data needs to be accessible, it needs to be replicable. People need to be able to not only revisit the sites and record the sites and obtain new records, but also to be able to replicate what's already been shown for that they need access to the data as originally was published. So I I'm absolutely convinced that it has to be the case worldwide, not just for South America. And so I was always a very, very, I was a very strong keen interest in trying to, to get Eric involved more with the South American paleontology community. So back in 2013, we set up a meeting, uh, which was called the first meeting on uh, databases in South American paleocology. And also it would be the second course on the use of Tilly for Windows. And of course, second, because Eric already been to Santiago and he already had taught a course. So that was the first course, of course, on Tilly, on the use of Tilly, but mostly to graduate students from, from, from universities in Santiago. But now really what we wanted to do is through funding by pages, for example, and the Millennium Scientific Initiative of the government of Chile, we actually got enough money to put together to set up this workshop. And as you can see, it was a four day workshop that we set up in Olimue, which is just a, a little resort town sort of located to the east of, to the west of Santiago in the foothills of the, of the coastal Cordillera, of the coastal, of the coastal mountains of Chile. And so here's Eric on his arrival, very, very cool person, you know, very cool profile, you know, keeping it little key um, centered right in the middle of this photograph uh, with all our young students and colleagues that helped put together this, this workshop. The workshop was held at this wonderful resort in Old Muey called Rosa Agustina. And you can see the backdrop here is actually the, is, is the coastal cordillera of central Chile, which is basically uh, one, of the, one of the few areas where we still see quite a bit of biodiversity that's still preserved in the landscape today. And in fact, Darwin was one of the people that visited these areas in La Campana Reservatory, which you can see in the background right there. And so it's, a, it's also very, it's, a, it's also a historical place for understanding ecology and evolution, not only in South America, but also throughout the world. So Eric, of course, with his time and generosity, gave a two-day lecture on the use of Neotoma and how you interface Tilly with Neotoma to a, a very, very large and diverse group of South American scientists. And the people that you see in this photograph are actually, the, uh, it's, they're, they're a diverse group of archaeologists, zoo archaeologists, paleocologists, paleontologists, uh, and even ecologists and geographers. So you can see that it was a very, very diverse group of people that were assembled for this workshop, about 50 to 60 people. And of course, Eric tirelessly went through and, and everybody had their laptops out and were uh, asking questions. And, and Eric, as, as everybody has already stated all throughout this afternoon, and uh, that Eric was always extremely generous in, in answering all these questions, always fun to work with. And of course, um, we managed to get through those four days 
because we had plenty of beer and, and, and wonderful dinners at night. So everybody was always looking forward to that in the after the very, very extensive long sessions during the day that we usually ended up wrapping sometimes as late as eight o'clock in the evening. And, you know, of course, we all have a photograph probably very standing in front of an HDF plot using bacon. So, so you, you, most of you probably exactly know what exactly what this graph is. And, but for me, actually, um, the use of bacon as an HDF software was first presented to me by Eric at this meeting. So even, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, of some more established pedagogists by then actually learned a lot from this workshop as well. So it was a wonderful opportunity to get up to date with some of the stuff that Eric was doing. And of course, Eric offered all this information in, you know, with the generosity that characterizes him. And um, so this was part of the, the two day graduate course that he gave after we'd finished the, the, the first open meeting that we, uh, the two day open meeting. So what you see here is a photograph of basically the people that were united for that first workshop. And um, you can see that the people standing here in the audience include, you know, paleontologists from Venezuela, like, um, Ascanio over here, back here, Chilean paleontologists like Enrique, Peruvian paleontologists like Jan Noel. Um, there are other people in here from Paraguay, from Ecuador, from Colombia, of course, and of course, people from Argentina and Chile, which made up actually the, 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 the bulk of the, of, the, of the attendees at this meeting. And of course, Eric is the central figure here at this workshop, as you can see here from the photograph. And of course, Eric also became a national Chilean. No, that's not true, but he, he would have been if he wanted to. I mean, he was, he was absolutely more than welcome anytime he wanted to be, you know, it, it back in Chile. Sorry for the quality of the picture, but I actually stole this off somebody's Facebook site. So I hope they gave me permission to use it. And then of course, Eric and I had to go up and see the, the La Campana National Park because that's obviously a very, not only a, a, an interesting um, uh, place to visit from the biogeographical and floristic point of view, you know, they have all this gone one and floor basically just, you know, blooming out there, uh, uh, going crazy, but also the fact that it's also a very interesting historic landmark as it was, you know, as I mentioned before, it's one of the places that Darwin had visited way back in the, 18, in the 19th century. And then, and then finally, of course, I, I just want to finish and this very, very brief overview of, 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 of Eric's impact on, on, on paleocological database with basically just two phrases. One of them has repeated itself over and over here. And of course, it's generosity and it's, trem it's tremendous knowledge and the impact that he had but you can also see the faces of the people that are assist that are attending this workshop, and you know there's not a lot of gray hairs in that in that audience. So you can see that this is actually a very very young crowd of people, and most of these people were were either into the PhDs or early postdocs, and so for the most part were mostly very early career researchers. So at least what I think in terms of Eric's impact on the paleocology of South America is 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 actually will be even greater in the foreseeable future, as many of these people actually reach the height of their careers. So I'm actually looking much, I'm looking really forward to that to, under, to actually see how all the generosity that Eric gave and all this time that he gave to working with us. And, and even, even after the workshop had finished, my students and other students write to Eric trying to understand Tilia, how to use Tilia as, as Alan was pointing out, not a very easy software to understand off of first basis as a sort of very long learning curve. And Eric would always answer his emails as you know, often within minutes of them being sent off. And, 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 and with, with all the knowledge that characterizes him. So at least his legacy in South America, I think will last for many, many years and over the coming decades and it will go just grow over time. So that's really what I wanted to say. And, and I wanted to thank Suzette and, and, um, and Buzz and Jack for really helping to shape this workshop and put this, thing, this, this, this event together. For me, it's, it's been wonderful to hear all these talks and, and see all, this, all the slides and the photographs. Thank you.